uh, <clears throat> committed entire his, life, his entire life to to establish Israel capital in all of Jerusalem, East and West. So that was a missed opportunity. I feel very strongly that President Biden, in the wake of recent development, that is the normalization of relations between uh, the, the UAA, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, has now provided us with a new opportunities. Basically, the Arab state have gone weary, tired of the Palestinian intransigence. They see more eye to eye with Israel, specifically because of the Iranian threat. And for them, Israel is a significant greater, great power in the region, probably the, the only power in the region that can uh, confront, confront Iran, um, uh, mischievousness in the region and, and continuing threat. So here again, I say the Biden administration ought to be able to capitalize on what is happening now, albeit many changes have taken place on the ground in terms of the interdisbursement of Israeli Palestinian, the future of Jerusalem, national security concern, all of that put together makes it impossible in some ways to have, um, uh, whereas I still believe a two-state solution is the only solution, but the makeup, the framework of such a solution may well, very well have to be falling fall under a confederation of sort. We can, if you ask me questions about that, I'll be happy to, of course, to respond to it. Briefly about Iran, I think the withdrawal from the Iran deal was a terrible, terrible mistake. Terrible mistake in that if we look now back from the time we withdrew from the, from the Iran deal, what has been achieved? Practically, not only we achieved nothing, we basically stepped backwards. And that is Iran today in a stronger position in terms of its production, quality and quantity of its uranium. And it is, and not, notwithstanding the sanctions, really Iran has not been affected by that much as other powers continue to operate and continue to work with Iran in spite and despite of the sanctions. So here again the Biden administration has a great opportunity now to revisit the Iran deal but not just revisit the Iran deal in and of itself and try to improve it and work on it but also we need another track, second track to deal with Iran's other activities in the region. That is, Iran is supporting extremist groups, Hezbollah, Hamas, other Islamic jihadis. So, so this is something that cannot be totally isolated from our discussion with Iran in connection with its nuclear weapon. The Iran obviously would like to separate the two issues. We are willing to separate the issues dealing with its nefarious activities throughout the Middle East, but we also have to understand that it resuming or reinstating the Iran deal in and of itself will not change in a very dramatic way the change that we need to, to have in order to normalize relation in the end with Iran. Iran is not going to disappear. We have to find a formula by which we begin that kind of process however long it might take. But the decision needs to be made. Iran is what it is today. We have no business going to try to effect regime change in Iran especially when we look at what happened to us right here in the United States in the last, uh, last, uh, last four years. Uh, so we are not in a position now to advocate the, the virtues of democracies and what they should be doing or not be doing. But be that as it may, uh, we have then again here another opportunity to, to do something about Iran and reduce the tension in the region and potentially even uh, normalized relation with Iran uh, when, and, uh, and potentially even in years to come, maybe three or four years, even Israel could come, uh, Iran, Iran and Israel relation could also improve because we have to remember Iran has never been an enemy of Israel going back all the, all the time the Shah was uh, the, the king of Iran, the relationship between the two countries were very strong until 1979 with the Iranian revolution. We have opportunity to change course there, and I hope the Biden administration does that. Uh, the other, the other two or three that I just mentioned very briefly, given the time limitation, that is the war in Yemen. That is the most tragic, the most tragic calamity that has been inflicted on any country since World War II in terms of the suffering of the people. Just imagine million, a million children are, 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 having, are infected by cholera, millions are starving to death, uh, the situation is beyond word to describe how horrifying it is. The United States has done practically nothing. In fact, it has supported the Saudis, has supported uh, other Gulf states to continue the campaign in Saudi Arabia against the 
Houthis, which are supported by Iran. Uh, that was uh, a, a this is still a terrible, terrible situation, and I think the Biden administration ought to be looking at that and 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 making a supreme effort to end this calamity that's taking place in Yemen. Uh, Syria has been obviously neglected, going back even to the Obama administration, not just not just Syria by by Trump. Here too. Uh, can we, in fact, continue to have this chaos taking place in Syria? Albeit, Russia is the key player in Syria, and that is, the United States, with Biden, with the best of intention, can do very, very little unless he work closely with Russia, because Russia is, is a, may have, well, the final word when it comes to the future of Syria. And this is very important, however, we need to engage Russia in that regard, and that is going to impact, of course, our relation with Russia on many, many other, other fronts. But this is a good point to start with a collaboration between the two countries to try to affect some change in Syria to end that horrifying uh, more than 10 year civil war that has to come to an end. That's something in EBT dealt with. Uh, the Biden administration will be facing many other challenges in the Middle East and uh, what to do with Lebanon, which is totally unstable, uh, how to address the problem with uh, extremists like Hezbollah, like, like Hamas, like other Islamic groups. These are all challenges that face the United States. I am not going to suggest to you that we, the United States, ought to be the policemen of the world today. Uh, what uh, the damage that Trump has caused to America, it's incalculable. It will take us years. And when you allude, will the United States be able to lead, to assume that Lord of Leadership, global leadership, specifically when it comes to the European continent and other places, this is going to take a tremendous amount of work. I personally believe America can resume its role, leadership role in the world, provided it it's, uh, upholds the kind of commitment and the credibility, the moral tenant, the, the courage to do the right thing and understand the one critical principle that we cannot do anything today unilaterally. That is our friendship, our alliance in the European community is central, is central to the growth, prosperity and security of the European community as well as the United States. I'll stop here because I know I already passed my time limit, and I'd be more than delighted, of course, to answer any of the questions that may follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ben Mayo, for sharing your uh, your uh, thoughts and also for uh, for sharing your your emphasis on 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 uh, multilateralism that is uh, a required principle in order to better solve uh, problems. And you outlined critical uh, regional conflicts in the Middle East that uh, require specific solutions under the Biden administration. Uh, having said that, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Lazaro for uh, your own uh, initial remarks. Dr. Lazaro. Thank you very much, uh, George, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to Sifa and to you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to, to listen to Professor Ben Meyer uh, for these introductory remarks because his emphasis on the Middle East is clearly, it's a region where American leadership and American power has been uh, often, uh, it's often judged the extent and the abilities of American power. And, and I think that starting with this focus was very interesting. I'm going to take a step back and look at this question of the return of American leadership on a bit uh, more of a macro level. Um, and I will start by saying that Joe Biden himself has made kind of the motto of his foreign policy agenda, the idea that America must lead again and why America must lead again. And he's also often been quoted saying, uh, we must not lead by the example of our power, but by the power of our example, which would suggest that he would like to restore to the US not only power, but soft power or some type of power of, of projection of a model of, of not principles of values. And, and this creates a huge challenge for the United States because on the one hand, we have a president-elect next week, a president who comes with this ambition of restoring uh, US leadership based not only on material hard power, but actually on the value of what the United States stands for in the international um, order and particularly, I guess, liberal international order. And at the same time, this is the United States where a week ago, 
we witnessed events which suggest to the world that the United States itself is suffering or perhaps is in danger of having a crisis in its democracy that it has not had before, a result of the years that have passed. And even today, just before we started um, this seminar, um, I work in Brussels, as you mentioned, the European Union just issued a statement where it regretted that for the first time in several years, a woman has been uh, executed with the death penalty on the federal level in the United States. So but, uh, the death penalty having just been restored on the federal level in the United States. Again, this is something that makes the United States look like a proponent of issues that it is fighting against in the world in this Biden worldview. So what will it take for the United States to restore this leadership? I wanted to use the next three, four minutes to reflect on that, thinking about the components of leadership. Because when we think of leadership on the global level, we have to think of three levels. The level of the leader, the level of the challengers, and the level of the followers. So let's think in these three categories. How can the United States itself, first of all, what does it need to do to be a global leader, arguably again? I think everyone would agree that the first thing the United States will have to look at, and I think Biden and Harris have been very clear on that, is getting things straight at home. It's managing the multiple domestic crises, which include of course, the health crisis, include the crisis of society, democracy with the polarization, and which include the economy, investment and jobs. And if one looks at the domestic agenda, it is very clear that these challenges are there. But the question really is, how will the administration be able to uh, and how swiftly to address these challenges in a way that make the United States function in a way that in, um, that increases GDP, but also creates an environment which can project the soft power externally. So I would argue that getting things to work at home and um, sort of self-repair, as Bill Burns has said, is the first step of the United States being able to exert this global leadership. And this is very relevant because the, the question of leadership today also begs the following question, is leadership in the 21st century or rather the post-COVID world uh, multilateral order going to look like what it was before? Will it be about security? Will it be about military capabilities? Will it be about economic capabilities? Or will it also be about health capabilities or the ability to run a sustainable economy? So I think all of these ideas are there in the challenge for the United States to be a leader. So the domestic level is one thing. But the, 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 the second level, of course, is doing abroad what Biden has promised to do. And if one looks at the Biden foreign policy agenda, I would argue there's a number of issues on the regional level, but perhaps that which would most reinstate the United States in the world mindset as a, as a leader would be to really manage to make progress on two fronts. One is managing to reform multilateralism because it is indeed the need for reform of multilateral structures that has fed the sort of Trump anti-globalist agenda. So to move ahead with a reform of the United Nations that makes sense, that is effective, with a reform of the World Health Organization to rejoin uh, those organizations, those agencies of the UN that the Trump administration abandoned, both in terms of helping Palestinians, development aid, etc., human rights, etc. Um, but also uh, in, in multilateral areas like NATO, for example, Biden has promised to try and bring into NATO um, a more um, political approach where democracy matters most. So I think, I think this revitalization of multilateralism with democracy and effectiveness at its center would bring the United States back to a position where it is seen as leading multilateralism and leading, leading um, the international uh, community of liberal democracies, particularly where they would uh, towards a direction. And that is very important. So domestic and foreign. And then obviously taking the important role that it should diplomatically and militarily if needed in those crises that are regional and we can talk about again. Just very briefly, on the challengers, no matter what the United States does, Russia, China are not what they used to be 20 years ago. And I think managing the relationship with those countries will be critical in determining the 
power of the United States to implement its foreign policy goals globally. It was mentioned Russia's role in the Middle East is very is becoming substantial, has become. China's role in Africa and Latin America, but of course in Eurasia and Asia is critical, not to mention the South China Sea. There are real challengers today to global powermanship. And I think they will, that what the challengers do and how that is mitigated will be very critical. And finally, about the followers, just to say there is an assumption that United States power uh, and leadership means that it has a group of committed followers among liberal democracies. And looking at the public opinion in the Western world after four, four years of Trump administration, trust in the United States is low. And as has been mentioned here, places that they like the EU, which are the natural transatlantic ally, have uh, indeed thought about how they could go it alone if need be. Now, they do not want to. That's not the idea. Uh, but I think it's important to say that the United States will need to build new partnerships also with its allies because of the past four years. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Lazaro, for offering your uh, broad perspective and uh, for uh, uh, synthesizing the leadership uh, term around the different pillars that are important for the United States to go back to the international stage and, and, and practically exert uh, leadership as it used to do in, in, in previous uh, years. Uh, having said that, I would like to give the floor to Professor uh, Mayrovich for your uh, remarks on the subject. Unmute, uh, unmute yourself. I was thanking you very much, uh, George, Matthias, Sif, for involving me. And of course, I think Professor Lazaro has ESP because I was looking at my notes and I think maybe she saw them. But in any event, I'm going to go a little further than what I was uh, hearing here previously. First of all, the United States is the indispensable power in the world. Now, the way the United States became the indispensable power in the world is because not so much of soft power, because of military power and military prowess. The reason I say that, the United, right now we're sitting here in the House, is, as Professor Lazaro indicated, involved, in, we have a lot of domestic issues. We're actually in proceedings to impeach the president a second time. This is a polarizing event. And if you think this is going to stop on January 20th, after hearing the debate in the House, forget that. It's going to go on. Now, the problem you have, and again, this is really uh, kind of intermestic or linkage politics with domestic and foreign policy. Uh, again, this is a very, you're going to think it's a small point, but if the filibuster is taken away in the Senate and the Democrats control the entire government, there's going to be a real, uh, a real breakup in the two parties. And certainly the impact of President Trump on the Republican Party has been momentous, momentous. Our democracy obviously is in great peril. Uh, I, I quote is sort of along the lines of what has been stated, Richard Haas's very good title, foreign policy begins at home. And that is really true right now. Can we get over the crisis? Can we get over the pandemic? Uh, and I have to say that I don't believe, I looked at Joe Biden's foreign policy paper on the internet. I didn't read a lot about Europe. I'm sorry to say this to Steve and all of my distinguished friends and colleagues here. The number one issues right now is China. China, 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 and China. That's on the list of, of the memo for President Biden. And particularly the way China has taken over taken over international institutions like the UN and the WHO, and I say taken over, gone in to try to take over those institutions to prevent them from criticizing China. China is an existential threat at this point. If you look at the Belt and Road Initiative and the militarization of these arrangements and the South China Sea, which has been mentioned, and the String of Pearls and the military ports, the United and the South China Sea in particular, you see a full-on challenge to the what you call the liberal international order. So the choice that we have going forward is an American international order, a liberal international order, or a China international order. Now, Russia also plays a role in this too. In other words, our adversaries, 
America's adversaries are very formidable, whether they be North Korea, China, or Russia. If you look at the Biden paper on North Korea, he really says there that, you know, we'll have dipl diplomats meet with them. Well, you know, I say it again, uh, and I'm not complimenting President Trump, but he actually had an opportunity to talk to the, the mad leader of North Korea, um, you know, and, and, and really on China, our situation has really deteriorated tremendously. It's tremendously fraught. And the, where the multilateral issue comes to play is the United States alliance with India, Japan, and Australia. That's the key multilateral arrangement that will, will pr preserve the world peace. Because you see that the Chinese oversensitivity on Taiwan just came out recently. Hong Kong should be a, it's kind of like the canary in the mine. If you watch Hong Kong and you watch ta Taiwan, you see the way the future is going to play out. The United Nations, this is really another important point, the United Nations and international institutions have lost their credibility. I personally was vice president of the United Nations Association of New York. I'm no opponent of the UN. But if you look at the UN today, and you look at the WHO, one is horrified and embarrassed by their incompetence and inefficiency. The Secretary General of the UN called for a world ceasefire in light of the pandemic. And absolutely nobody, except I think related to Yemen, I think uh, there was one, one country that said, I think the Houthis said, no, we're not going to do it. The Saudis said, yes. Nobody listened to the Secretary General of the United Nations. That, does that tell you something? about the lack of influence of the UN and the Chinese, and you can read up on this obviously in the Human Rights Commission, et cetera, have tried to co-opt these agencies. Now, it was not a good decision on the part of Trump to withdraw from the WHO. Clearly we should be in there, we should be involved in it, we should be changing and doing what we need to do to make sure it does not, it's not the orphan child or the captive child of China. Now I totally agree with uh, the points made earlier, that the problem the United States is, has is to rebuild its credibility in the world. I absolutely agree with that. I think that that we have lost in the Trump years, no question about it. And no credibility, and of course, lack of predictability. Calming everything down, that is the meritorious result of Biden. Now, if we can't calm down our domestic politics, then we're not going to be able to project our influence in the world. And that is very, very sad. Now about soft power and hard power, I know Professor Lazaro, if I may, with all due respect, uh, wants the America to use its soft power. Soft power, with all due respect, does not work well with China because China is using sharp power. Now sharp power, as you know, in Professor Walker's essays, is China's infiltration into media and into academia through Confucius Institutes and others around the world to try to infiltrate, I'm using the word, I'm sorry, maybe you don't agree with me, but I think it's, a, it's very, very clear to watch, I mean, again, I, 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 you'll forgive me, but it, sharp power is not a good thing. So the first thing we need to do is to stop the Chinese influence, the Russian influence, the sharp power of Russia and China to intervene and interfere with the, with the politics of other countries, particularly democracies. That has to stop. And if you look at China's treatment of Australia, that the horrible way they have treated Australia indicates that they are so, so sensitive to criticism that they will use overpowering responses to crush their opponents. So that's the number one issue. India, to me, and the Malacca Straits and those issues, that is key to the future of American foreign policy. Now, I said India, I said China, I said Japan. I didn't say Europe because, and, and I, I want you, if you look in the Biden memo, honestly, I'm sure we're gonna have meetings, we're gonna have nice meetings, G7s, G20s, we'll have multilateral summits, we're gonna do all that and we'll be respectful. And that in and itself is very, very important. But I'm very, very pessimistic about the ability of the United States to fix its home. Now, about the Middle East, and I can't really let this go by in terms of some of the things that were said about Iran, with all due respect to Professor Ben Meir. Professor Ben Meir, you said that Iran is not an enemy of Israel. Now, I really have to ask about that because I believe Iran's leadership has said that it just wants to wipe Israel off the map. I, I have never heard 
any country of a major country make a statement like that, which is an existential threat to destroy another country. And in terms of the Iran deal, I would beg to differ on that deal because I, I really, and I do I agree with Professor Ben Mayer that the deal itself just in one part is insufficient. We need to deal with all the other parts. But the Iranians have said they're only going to put the deal back the way it was. They're not going to entertain any discussions about terrorism, ballistic missiles, sort of the issues that Pompeo spoke about at the Heritage uh, Organization. Well, if, if we're going to do a deal which has no verification, which this last deal didn't have verification, because of the possible military dimensions where the Iranians said, you cannot come onto my military bases to check if I'm developing a nuclear weapon. And we know from Israel, and we know from Netanyahu, who showed that the Iranians were developing a nuclear weapon. Now on the Middle East, and here is my qualm about, and my problem with the Middle East, in terms of Trump's deals. Each of the deals that were made in connection with the Abraham Accords has a little footnote. The UAE deal has the footnote that the United States is providing the UAE with F-35s. The deal with Morocco has the footnote that the United States is going to re recognize the Western Sahara, which is a long-standing regional dispute. In the Sudan, and this is very important, the United States, I believe, has agreed that American citizens, and I think cannot bring lawsuits against Sudan for having aided and abetted Al-Qaeda terrorists. This has been pushed back tremendously, including by an organization in Israel called Shirat Adin, that brings lawsuits around the world to try to sue countries that support terrorism. So in other words, it's sort of like, I call it the art of the deal. It's the art of the deal in the Middle East. It's sort of uh, bargaining to make deals. The F-35 is the most significant stealth fighter the United States has. If we give that to the uh, UAE, and I love the UAE, I have nothing against them. The issue is, and actually, interest, incidentally, so I do a lot of work on Turkey, that's the F-35 that Turkey lost when it went with the S-400. If we give the F-35 to UAE, they will get possible st strategic parity with Israel, which I can tell you right now, the United States Senate, when they come in and the Democrats are in control of at least the House and the presidency, there's still a filibuster, they will not, just like with the AWACS with Saudi Arabia, they will not support these deals. These deals will not be supported. So in conclusion, I would say that the world we see right now is very fraught, very complex. And I don't think that the solution for America, of course, is the Trump doctrine and to withdraw. We can't withdraw anymore. We need to be engaged in the world. But we need to be engaged in the world to show that America is the main and indispensable power in the world. This is the power that saved the world in World War I and World War II, including Europe, I might say, going to save the world. And this is not something where, you know, we, it's not a matter of courtesy or graciousness in the world. Our adversaries are powerful and they are pernicious. And they're not just against America, they're against the entire liberal international order, and we need to be able to stop them and contain them. We can do that together. We need to work together to do it, but with American leadership. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't go over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meirovitz, for uh, sharing your, your thoughts with us. What uh, I would propose now is to collect the two questions of, 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 uh, from the audience. We have one question from uh, uh, Piotr, which uh, uh, is related to how the Biden presidency could uh, cope with uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, so I could generalize and talk uh, about China in general. And we have uh, a question from Arthur, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, for, for Elena, but obviously uh, 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 anyone could uh, 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 reply to that. Uh, and the question is how the Biden presidency in the context of the transatlantic relationship might deal with illiberal uh, democracies. And uh, I would also have uh, uh, my own question, if I may, to, to use the privilege of, of the moderator, and this is uh, uh, relevant to, to some thoughts which uh, 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 I, I would like to share, and they are uh, relevant to 
uh, our discussion which uh, uh, focuses on some of the uh, uh, impact of the Trump presidency on, on, on uh, US leadership and American foreign policy choices. But I would like to challenge this and suggest that uh, it seems to me that uh, the uh, decline of the American leadership, uh, uh, if I may so, say so, has been the result of some uh, unsuccessful foreign policy choices in the 21st century. So it seems to me that to only focus on Trump might not necessarily outline the existing problem. So I uh, also feel welcome uh, to, to comment on, on, on points made by other speakers, of course. So by these three questions, I would like to, to give the floor to Professor Ben Mayer, please. Please unmute yourself. Still, we cannot hear you. Now it Can works. You, okay. It works well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. A um, uh, couple of things. Uh, let me first say about Iran, you know, what I said that until 1979, you know, Iran and Israel enjoyed a very, very close relationship. Historically speaking, the Persian people as such have had excellent relation with the Jews going back to the Cyrus the Great. So what I'm saying is that the current regime is obviously uh, threatened Israel existentially and otherwise. So we have to make a distinction between the two. I maintain though, if this regime is to remove the people, the Iranian people as such, do not hold any kind of hatred or animosity toward the Jews in particular. The second point, you know, it is not a choice between soft power and, and military power. In dealing with China, in dealing with Russia, in dealing with any power for that matter, these are tools. Sometimes you have to use soft power, sometimes you have to use hard power, and sometimes to use things in between. So it is not a choice that in dealing with China, we have so many different ways using soft power to make sure that China, you know, correct its ways in dealing with other parts and countries in, the, in its own region and elsewhere in the world. The, 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 the normalization of relation in which you alluded to, there is always in any kind of negotiation, any kind, there is always give and take. People want to get something in return. But the principle, the fact that the normalization of relations started between Israel and the Arab state, that is an extraordinarily significant thing that has taken place. Very important, not with, notwithstanding the very strings attached to this type of, to, this, to the normalization process. And we have to keep that in mind. That is, this is the only way we mm. can change the dynamics in the Middle East. And just to think in those terms, to, to deal with the Iranian threat, we can create a crescent parallel to the Iranian crescent going from Iran through Iraq, Syria to Lebanon, we can now create a crescent going from the Gulf state all the way to the Mediterranean and, and to block both Iran as well as Turkey. So we have to keep this, there's a much larger strategic approach to re resolving conflict in the region. So whether uh, the United States gave in on the Sahara or, gave in or decided to sell F-35, that is the kind of give and take it's in place. The question is, which is more important? That is, is normalization going to change the dynamic in the region? I think the answer to that is absolutely yes. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Lazaro? Thank you. Um, I think I'll start with the question which was directly addressed to me, uh, which if I understood correctly is what the transatlantic alliance can do vis-a-vis uh, -vis illiberal democracies, which is an interesting term. It's, it's more complicated than authoritarian regimes. It's, it's a mix. Um, mm -hmm. Turkey obviously comes to mind uh, because it's directly in the neighborhood of the EU and it's a NATO member. And I think there we have perhaps the first signs of a, a Biden orientation, which would be to, to continue engagement, but increase conditionality on, uh, and I use this term broadly, on, 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 the, on the sort of conduct according to 
um, democratic principles, but also to the rule of law. We saw that in his statement that he would like to see NATO reformed in a way that its members have a greater commitment to uphold democratic principles um, and the rule of law. And, and But beyond just that, uh, because it's not just about Turkey, this is about places that can go as far as Brazil, actually, because there as well we have an illiberal democracy. So when I think, I personally feel when we talk about the transatlantic relationship, it's a relationship that in third countries we should think very broadly about the rest of the world. Uh, so I think a, a strategy to engage with illiberal democracies has many components. It has the, the carrot of trade, uh, but it also has to bring with that offering better trade relationships, but on the basis of, and the basis of could be um, compliance with <clears throat> labor standards, compliance with climate standards, compliance with, un, with international law. But it also has a lot to do with uh, what Professor Meirovitz mentioned, which is fighting disinformation and fighting uh, interference in democracy. Because the reason why I would argue we have this hybrid illiberal democracy uh, regime today, which we didn't have that much before, is because of interference. And interference and the way it happens today through digital platforms, through social media, means that the practice of democracy continues, but the minds of people are illiberally affected by fake and, and uh, aggressive information, which creates a very peculiar situation. You cannot legally say that the democratic system is not functioning. There's elections taking place and people are voting, uh, but they are being manipulated through other ways. So uh, I think to fight this kind of situation, it's very important for the EU and the US to coordinate on responsibility of digital platforms, on regulating these illiberal platforms uh, in a way that is both respectful of privacy and of freedom of information. It's also important to strengthen their own cybersecurity. And there I think to have a, a, a sovereign, sort of autonomous te technological industrial base that is not dependent on others. And, and here China also comes into play is important. And to cooperate with other democracies to strengthen these practices. So I think this is one way towards this, this issue. Now on China specifically, I think the question is very valid and it's not just, uh, just the Belt and Road. We now have the RCEP uh, that is advancing as well, which if, if that goes well for China, I mean, the, the whole of Southeast Asia is, is, is a huge zone of influence. Um, and again, I think the way to contain or to sort of to balance out China is relations with third countries, strengthening multilateral institutions institutions that China has to adhere. It cannot just be a member and not keep the rules. It has to keep the rules. Uh, but I also think what's going on right now between the EU and China, and they will also between the US and China, well, where you engage, but this engagement will mean specific controls for Chinese products. It will stop the subsidies, uh, Chinese subsidies to their own products. Uh, it will allow investment in China without necessarily having to sell out uh, inter intellectual property mm. rights. So I think these kinds of things would be a way to to counter or to not to counter. I don't like to think of China as an enemy, but really to have a balanced relationship. Thank you very much, Dr. Lazaro. The floor for uh, Professor Mayowitz, please. All right, let me hit you the questions and then respond to some of the points. First of all, on the Belt and Road Initiative, I think one way the United States and its allies can fight this is by helping these debt trapped countries, because basically the Chinese come in, get people to sign promissory notes, then they can't pay it back. And then they go, okay, can I have a port with a military ship? And can I do this and that? So we have to get in there and help those countries get out of their debt trap. So that's number one. I think on the China part, something that is very important to keep in mind is China's rebuke and rejection of international law standards. I think that's been alluded to by Professor Lazaro. In other words, when they got the decision of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and admittedly, they said there has no jurisdiction. They said that the decision that the uh, Chinese legal arguments of historic rights were not valid, and a 500-page opinion, the Chinese leadership said it's a piece of trash paper. Well, that's very interesting. They want to be on the Security Council. They want to be in international institutions. But when an international court renders a decision, it's a piece of trash paper. So 
they want to use might. The United States so far, maybe it's not soft power, but freedom of navigation operations is a good way to operate. And I hope we don't end up with like the situation that Mike Fabi describes in Crashback, where we actually have direct confrontations. We need to, the United States needs to promote international law and freedom of the sea. Secondly, on the illiberal democracies, this is a tricky thing. Now, Biden has said he's going to call a democracy summit. The problem I see from domestic politics is, and international politics is that we don't want Biden to become another Jimmy Carter. I respect Jimmy Carter. He has a heart of gold. He was a wonderful person. He was a wonderful person and a very, very weak president. Uh, that's what I'm worried about. What we need to have right now is, Amer again, American strength. A democracy summit is a great idea. How you call to task these democracy, illiberal democracies is a big problem because they've been, of course, you know, encouraged by President Trump who loves authoritarians and liberal democracies. So there's got to be an intermediate way not to degenerate into a card of presidency which becomes inefficient and, in, and incompetent. On George's question is a great question. And I think when we look at these immediate issues, we're not looking back in foreign policy sufficiently. The Iraq war is still a bone of contention in the Middle East and the entire region. The Vietnam war, Vietnam syndrome, all these things are there. They're facts of life. So I think the point is the United States and Joe, Joe Biden is well, is well positioned to be able to look back because he's been in the government all these years. So I think if he, he has a very good choice for Secretary of State, good diplomats coming in and just, there's actually, I think in The Economist or one of these publications, they show Biden walking through the Oval Office with piles of letters and memos, gotta be able to first come in and deal with the pandemic and deal with these issues. Now, on the point about the Iranian people that Professor Ben Mayer said, which is a very interesting point, the Iranian people have no choice in what they're doing. The regime controls them. We know with the Basaj militia beating down the people, the people have no choice. I'm sure the Iranian people are wonderful people, but they have no democratic chance to express themselves. I'm sure they would want to have a good relationship with Israel, but they can't because the regime is so hostile. And on that pivot, I would say that the glue that keeps together the Abraham Accords whether it's with Bahrain or UAE or Morocco or Sudan, and mostly Saudi Arabia, because the relationship with Saudi Arabia is based on a fear of Iran. Now, what happens if the Biden administration is in fact able to negotiate a deal with Iran? What happens then to that glue because it's the fear of Iran? Do, I mean, I, I, I don't believe, by the way, that there is an optimistic or, or halcyon future for Iranian-U.S. relations, as long as Iran's regime is controlled the way it's controlled at the present time. Um, in terms of the give and take of the accords, that's absolutely correct. But the problem is, how do you get, in our, in our country, these kinds of arrangements will be subject to scrutiny, ultimately, after January 20th, by the Senate, by the House, by the Congress, are they going to approve? They didn't like the AWACS deal with Saudi Arabia, and I bet they will not, maybe not like the UAE deal. They may not like the Sudan deal. They may want to try to push back on it. And in this world of Biden, that's a world where the Congress has something to say, and they really have influence because the Democrats are going to have a lot of influence. So um, I certainly learned a lot, and I thought it was a lot of fun, and, uh, and thank you very much for the privilege of participating. Thank you very much. It would be tempting to discuss uh, uh, all these issues for the entire night, but we are entering the third and last uh, round of, 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 of questions. Uh, uh, we have received uh, different questions, so I would, I would like to, to invite uh, Professor Ben Mayer, Dr. Lazaro and Professor Mayrovic uh, to, to reply to, to, to these questions, which I will address now and share also your, your final remarks. I see at the beginning that there are many questions about, uh, about China. I would like to, to remind our, our audience that tomorrow SIF will organize a, a debate that will only focus on, on China in partnership with the Istanbul Aydin University at two o'clock French time. So this will be a, a good opportunity to discuss these issues again. If I can... Uh, uh, summarize the, 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 the questions from, from uh, the audience and I would like to th thank the audience for, for sharing so many interesting questions. 
We do have a question about the domestic priorities of, of Joe Biden and up to what extent he could reverse some of the executive orders of President Trump. We have another question about uh, American leadership on, on, on climate change. Uh, another question about uh, uh, cooperation opportunities between uh, the Biden presidency and countries like Germany in particular and the UK in particular. And a general question about how the United States could remain the world power taking into account what happened in the last four years. I can understand that you cannot address all the questions. I would like to, to ask them as a matter of respect to, 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 to the people who ask them. So I would like to give the floor to, for, to Professor Ben, May ben Mayer at first. Uh, you know, briefly, when we speak about American leadership, leadership is, uh, is not uh, just military. Military is very important. America is the most powerful country. Uh, militarily speaking, but it's also America is the most power, has the greatest and strongest economy as well. Uh, technologically speaking, America is in the lead uh, throughout, throughout the world. But what has eroded in American leadership is not military or economic per se, even though it's temporary or technology, it is a moral erosion. What we have experienced in our leadership is the moral erosion of American leadership. And that is something that we're going to have to work on very hard in order to, to repair. Because without having moral leadership, you soft uh, military or economic power are not going to substitute for what which is essential, specifically in our alliance with the European community and our allies in the Middle East. So this is, we, we, we have to keep in mind the, <clears throat> The other um, uh, and a question, you know, as far as Iran was mentioned, you, you know, um, to suggest that Iran is a perpetual enemy, that is not how you're going to solve international conflict. Iran is a fact of life. The question is, we have to ask ourselves, has our policies in the past been successful in dealing with Iran? And the answer to that is no. The Iran deal was a good step forward. We, the idea was to build on it in order to move eventually to a normalization of relationship. What the Trump has done basically destroyed that prospect of being able to build on the Iran deal, and that obviously did not happen. And uh, the, the fi finally, I want to, to, to mention is the, uh, you know, you're talking about democracy and election as if election er, uh, is equal to democracy. Election is only a part of a democratic form of government. You need to have democratic pillars to sustain democracy. You have to have a totally a free press. You have to have democratic institution, things that and be able to say to operate, F freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. That is missing to suggest election is enough represent that is not going to happen turkey calls itself democracy obviously it is anything but a democracy uh, even israel i have issue with israelis who call themselves we are a complete democracy i don't think israel is a complete democracy either because of the internal political combustion within the various political parties and and and, and, and it's such so to be sure america's role is indispensable it will remain indispensable. I can only hope that the Biden administration realize that that is what is necessary is to restore American credibility and moral leadership. But when it comes to domestically, Biden administration ought to be absolutely focusing first and foremost on getting on dealing with the virus. The virus and the economy are intertwined. If the virus is not dealt with effectively, American economy will not be revived. That is essential first step for the first hundred days where Obama or where Biden ought to focus on. Thank you, Professor Ben May, Dr. Lazaro. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to pick up first on a question that was somewhere in the many, many questions, which was something I wanted to say, but I didn't manage to have time to, which is about um, the uh, American diplomacy and really the structure that carries out US foreign policy, because I think one point we didn't mention is 
is the severe cuts and delays under the last administration in, in resources, both human resources and financial resources for the State Department, for the various agencies that carry out U.S. policy, particularly in the area of, of development uh, and, and, and aid, which we haven't really touched upon, but which is a really large component of American global power. Um, so I think one thing that's very important looking forward, uh, the question was, can it be restored? And yes, of course, it can be restored. Resources can be reinvested. But I think it's an important component looking forward of, of the Biden administration's ability to, to carry out a foreign policy of a global power, to have the right people, to have the right amount of people, to have the agencies and to have the financing. Um, and I think this will be a challenge uh, but in, 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 in something very interesting to watch in the first uh, months of the administration. Uh, I remember when Trump took over, we in Brussels were watching for days, for, for months. Will there be an ambassador to the EU? And he came <laughs> here later and a lot of the ambassadorial appointments were extremely delayed. This creates a diplomatic, it's a diplomatic step back for a country. So I think, I think that will be very, very important. And it will also be important to have a foreign policy apparatus which acts with credibility and creates trust in, with partners, allies, but also non-partner, non-allies, but countries they engage with. Because I think the big blow with the JCPOA, the Iran agreement, it was always imperfect. And I think both sides of the Atlantic knew that there were a number of issues that Pompeo has mentioned, has been, have been mentioned here, that were not addressed uh, in the beginning, because to reach a deal, and Wendy Sherman talks about this very often, there had to be a point of agreement. But once they had agreed, there was trust, some element of trust and some element of credibility. And by walking away from this arrangement, I think my perception is the United States opened to Iran also the, the chance to, to walk away from commitments to say, you did it, we're doing it. And, and, and then also diplomacy needs to have foresight. And foresight is also about understanding that the moment an economy of a, a liberal country starts going bad, all sorts of other forces will challenge that particular leader with whom you've signed this agreement. And this is happening in Iran and it's happening in Turkey, everywhere where the economy is going very bad in these countries. It doesn't bode, bid well for democracy. So that's on the question about diplomacy and foreign policy. On climate, it's interesting, we haven't talked about it, but of course uh, the question was, is this just an EU domain? And obviously it's not just an EU domain. I think Biden comes with climate very high on his domain domestic and foreign policy agenda. He's committed to rejoining the Paris Agreement, which he can easily do within 30 days. That was also a question. Um, and, uh, and also to finance again uh, the Green Climate Fund, which is a financing for developing countries uh, and to raise the bar. But we have to see how this is going to go. Uh, both the EU, China and the US have all committed to, to reducing their carbon footprint and carbon emissions by the next 15 years. But I think COVID and financing COVID recovery, we'll have to look at how this plays into, into that, uh, that challenge. Biden can reverse a lot of the executive orders that Trump issued by executive order, but we, I think we can be optimistic that he can do a lot, assuming that Congress forms as we think it's going to form, that the Senate goes to the Democrats following the Georgia election. I think that it will be easy to carry out policy uh, because of the way Congress is also structured. Um, so I think that these are my responses and maybe just to end with a comment on soft power. I said soft power because Biden says the power of our, of our example. Uh, at the same time, it would be hard not to notice how high the US defense budget is these past, this past decade. And I, I do not think we are at the age of 15 years ago where we thought soft power goes with low defense budgets. I think we're at the age where we're learning that you could have a high defense budget and then you also want to have soft power to somehow exercise a combined, as, as Professor Ben Meyer said, uh, a, a, an approach where you can use those tools when you see fit. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Lazaro. La last but not least, Professor Mayer. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, combining hard power and soft power, that was Hillary Clinton called that smart power. And I totally agree with that. That definitely, but, but it has to be uh, addressed to the circumstances where we are. 
Um, I know some interesting questions in here. One was very interesting, you know, how do you root for the United States unless it has, I'm paraphrasing, it has democratic values. So what's the difference between the US, China and Russia actually? I'm really paraphrasing that one. And I have to confess, I'm guilty, I'm an American. Okay, so as an American, I find that to be somewhat, uh, uh, you know, uh, a problematic question. The United States, at least the way Reagan spoke about America, and you'll forgive me for my patriotism, he spoke of America as a city on a hill, a shining city on a hill, as an example to the world. And I can prove that because the world is obsessed with what is going on in the United States. I mean, we're not sitting around and figuring out what's going on in some small municipality. Everybody in the world, all the media, you name it, BBC, European media, everybody wants to know every detail. So, and the next point about democratic values. Joe Biden won the election, he actually did. He won the election. That was a victory for democratic values. That proves that our institutions work. The fact that the challenges in the courts against the elections were overturned, that not one case succeeded, that the Supreme Court, in which there are three nominees of President Trump with a conservative majority of six to three, threw out Texas versus Pennsylvania, throughout all the cases that's the that's the idea of the founding fathers that have, that the institutions should be robust and strong enough well we've had a big challenge to our institutions now with the whole issue of coming up with impeachment we have to see how that that plays out but the question of moral erosion of american leadership i would disagree with that yes the trump years have been tremendously challenging but biden came in and he won the election on the basis of a moral vision and a vision of democracy. And most importantly, calming down all of this horrible excitement and violence and all of this challenge to our democracy. So I think we have better times ahead. But to Professor Lazaro, I wanna say about the executive orders. Well, yes, it's not desirable for Trump to do an executive order and then Biden to come in and do executive orders. Now, the problem you have in the Senate is you want it to be bipartisan, but if the filibuster continues, if there's still a filibuster, that means you need 60 votes in the Senate to pass a bill, which means the Republicans will, in effect, be able to block legislation. Without going through all the details of this, uh, Harry Reid, the former uh, Senate Majority Leader, argues that the Democrats should get rid of the filibuster so they can pass everything on a majority. That would truly be the demise of democratic principles. So I would love them to work together. And I think with Mitch McConnell and what we've been seeing after this occurred, the good take, the two good takeaways to this horrific, horrific event, shameless, shameful event. Number one, I teach constitutional law. Everybody's talking about the Constitution. Everybody's got their Constitution. And number two, for the, for the way I think the whole dialogue in the Congress has been so much better, it's been a little not so great on some of the Republicans, but it's sort of like hiding together against the mob, help them to understand that they're all on the same side. The last point on Iran, normalization of relationship with Iran, impossible with the uh, current regime. The current re the regime uh, snookered us tricked us when they did this deal by saying military bases you can't go on you can go here you can't go there and they actually were developing a weapon so if anybody thinks and wendy sherman in particular you know i mean it was amazing comment that she made she was criticizing trump because his north korea deal didn't have verification really the Iran deal had no viable verification. And the sanctions admittedly were very harsh on the people, and that's not a good thing, but at least the Iranians came along and that's why they went and sat at the table. So if you're dealing with a regime like that, that has this idea, these ideas about destruction of other countries and other things like that, you know, it's not so simple to come and say, let's just use soft power, let's just be a them. You can't, you have to be able to be forceful to help the people in Iran. They're the ones who's suffering, not, not, the, uh, not the regime. We need to do, and the only power in the world that can do this is the United States. Um, and we, so we, defense budget, admittedly, we need to build it because honestly, look at the defense, uh, look at the defense structure, for example, of the United Kingdom. I mean, do they have, how many boats do they have now? I have like, I don't know, two big carriers. I mean, these countries are no longer what they were before. And the only country in the world, the only stand up power that can stand up to globally is the United States. So I think with Biden, we have a shot at having an America 
that can be a shining city on the hill to the whole world. And that's what we're hoping and praying for. If we can get over this pandemic and this, this impeachment, if we can get over it, I think we're on our way. And then everybody here will be happy. And I'll be happy too. Right. And have a very nice day. Yeah, I'll be happy. <laughs> yes, right. That's what I want. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. With this, we are coming to an end. I want to sincerely thank our three distinguished speakers, Professor Ben Mayer, Dr. Lazaru, and Professor Merovitz for your participation and for offering your inputs to us. And obviously, uh, our uh, audience, uh, and especially those who have uh, contributed with uh, questions. I wish you a good uh, night and obviously to keep uh, healthy under this unprecedented circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Thanks to the speakers. It was great to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you.